Excellent. So I ended up doing this project at work. It's still work in progress, but trying to look for information on this as to who has been actually moving to the cloud was kind of difficult when I started off. Lots of stuff about oh, why big enterprises should go to the cloud and or whatever. Lots of startups saying this is how we did all our nice little greenfield projects, but what happens if you have legacy? There wasn't anything about it, so again, completeness and accuracy aren't guaranteed beyond best effort. I'm trying to be as accurate as possible, well, as accurate as was yesterday evening, but things can change, and it's a, well, it's the cloud, so it can go off anytime. So, to start off, what we had was fairly old hardware. It was mostly at the end of a refresh cycle. Uh, we had a lot of profitable legacy software, which we can't throw out. Hey, it makes 90% of your revenues. You're not going to throw it out. There's quite a bit of change that is happening. Uh, I work for a small games publisher, so software is uh, not really our core business. It's a business component. It's really essential for us to track stuff, but we are a marketing company, we really don't, it's not software that we care about to say, well, here's a big product. Lots of tracking stuff, so we have a small infrastructure team. The advantage that we had was we had OpenStack plus bare metal, CI, continuous integration with Jenkins, and we had working config management. If you don't have that continuous integration bit, that's the first thing you put in you really, really want every developer to be able to deploy with a single click or less. You just say git commit, git push, and it goes into production. If, it's, if you aren't at that point, you probably want to get there first before you start moving to the cloud. Cloud considerations. Cloud systems let you scale in smaller increments on demand. You can buy large servers today, but you really can't buy something where I say, I want one core delivered to me incrementally additionally. When you buy hardware, you're buying a bunch of it. And then maybe using a little bit, but that's quite a lot of money at one shot suddenly, sometimes, or you're just using a power, and power bills are fairly high in data centers. Uh, we have a fairly variable demand. If a game gets lucky, then, well, we certainly need a lot of servers, and, well, you need them for three months because that's how long, how long a game stays popular. If it doesn't, well, good luck. So if you have lots of variability, it's way better for you to be in something where you can stretch your resources. But if your demand is consistent and you are bigger, then it is probably worth staying in a DC itself. Being in the cloud is not always useful. Uh, legal issues are fun. We have uh, the GDPR nowadays uh, in the EU, so privacy regulation. So, and every country has a slightly different variant of privacy laws, so you can't work in every EU country either. Uh, we, and then we have different laws, in diff uh, plus, of course, Brexit, so we can't use a British data center. You can't use the German data center because they have so stringent regulation that we really would be out of business. And Software design, you need observability that needs to be built into your software. Your software must be capable of emitting metrics, logs, debug information, whatever it, if it's not doing that, you're not going to be able to do anything useful with it in the cloud. It's kind of difficult when you're trying to run a black box in there because you, things can and will go wrong. And they go wrong more often in the cloud than in this thing. For us, we had the advantage that we were doing Docker, we were doing a bunch of microservices already. Our old legacy software stack is Erlang and MySQL, newer stack is Python with microservices and MySQL. So Mesos in the, is in the DC, moving to Kubernetes was easy. We, the problem with having a very small infrastructure team is that uh, we were kind of getting stretched beyond what we could do in terms of simply hours available in which you can stay awake. So we were, a big win for us would be to outsource as much of the actual infrastructure work as possible if we can get it as a service. So it's kind of why we chose Google. Google was slightly cheaper, but they're both more expensive than running our own hardware. 
So at this point, iffy, but Google is still slightly better for us. Six months later, this may be different. You have to keep a very close eye on the financials all the time. So technical research phase, coming to conferences, talking to people, figuring out stuff, lots of Googling. Google is your friend again here. And we had two basic areas that we were looking at. How do you manage infrastructure and tooling? Mostly, we spent a lot of time on the manual management of infrastructure, very little on the tooling bit. Because manual work was basically familiarizing yourself with the environment, which was fine. Getting all the concepts, because well, everybody has their own terminology, different concepts, and a new language for every provider. And you want to discover what kind of interesting limitations those tools have. So for example, we were using Google's, we were planning to use Google's deployment manager, but it turns out that if it, you have one successful deploy with it, you cannot repeat that again. What? I mean, if something else causes that server to be deleted, and you rerun that uh, deployment engine, it says, yep, it has been deployed successfully, except you don't have a VM. Hey. So choosing Ansible tools, this was basically what we had at that point. We had shell scripts, which was basically the G, G Cloud plus GSUtil. There's Ansible, uh, okay, for some value of automation. Uh, Puppet, which wasn't uh, a serious contender six months ago. There, it's fairly new at this point, even their Google Cloud support. And it's not the nicest thing to use. Terraform is the best of the lot, which is saying quite a bit. Because uh, Terraform is, uh, using Terraform today feels like what using Puppet was back in 2006, 2007. It's less painful than the rest, but it's still painful. <laughs> so the problem is we have a small problem. Legacy code cannot be rewritten very quickly. So we have to do the whole lift and shift thing. We, are really, we really don't want to run both the DC and the cloud at the same time. Uh, because contracts and money, and it's a sheer waste of money because you can't really run half the service here, half the service there. Stateless systems, easy 12-factor apps. Uh, uh, I'm assuming everybody here is familiar with the 12-factor net uh, stuff. But you need configuration management for the rest. We were using Puppet, so we just kept using it. We just bumped our versions up straight to 5 point something. I have no idea what. Well, I think 5.3, but whatever it is. Inventory, there is no CMDB there in terms of being able to say what exists, what, are, what resources do you have. There's no quick view of being able to say, make an update here and let the rest of it just work out. What I don't want to do is be like, OK, here's the thing. Test your applications, test your stuff. What you want to be, ideally be able to do is, I want 15 machines of this type recorded here so I can also let the finance department know about uh, their existence and everything else. And then some tooling goes off, kicks off Terraform and does, well, provisions a new machine, comes back to me and says, OK, I have a new machine. And then because it's of default image, you get Puppet running and oh, it puts itself in the pool, adds itself to appropriate level, load balancers, everything. We currently hack our way around this by using tags in the Google API. If he, it's not the nicest solution again, but hey, for the moment it works. So we kind of have some inventory, but we don't have the, let's provision everything simply by updating this one web page thing. So moving into high speed, this was literally decided in 30 minutes with three people who were involved in deciding what to do about the whole thing and how we were going to go about it. Uh, we call it a proof of concept, but as it was said, it's basically production. So complete automation, custom tooling, and fixed target application for a test deployment. That is the one thing we haven't managed to do yet. We have a bunch of other applications that weren't supposed to be going into production that went into production, but the target application hasn't. It took us three months of full-time effort to wrap up the POC as POC, but that was mostly because we were 
experimenting with a bunch of stuff and figuring out the best ways to write Terraform uh, modules and other things. We ended up choosing Terraform it, because again, deployment manages broken horribly. The fast moving tool, so we have had a few upgrades in there and gone, oh wait, what this, oh, this is better, this is better, this is worse. They have good val documentation for some value of good. It reads like man pages, not how to's. But again, Puppet 10 years ago. New Puppet repo, we skipped everything that existed and simply went greenfield on this one because the la old stuff was a lot of mess. So make a different repo and if you need to, copy and paste. And we jump Puppet versions, of course. Uh, Terraform, we ended up with one basic network project that runs all our infrastructure. Turns out Google's hosted Kubernetes does not fit nicely into this part. It needs its own separate network in that project. Uh, we have a lot of internal separate projects for various uh, components or databases get something else, uh, applications get something else, logging and monitoring each get their own separate little project, which helps reduce the pain point of Terraform shared state. Most projects just use an instance template group, which is, so you say, here's a template, and then make instances of it, put it in a load balancer and all that, and Google's tooling will do that for you. I believe Amazon has something similar, but don't quote me on that. And we use Google's metadata to tie together Puppet and Terraform, so what role, the server basically figures out what role it has by querying the API, and says, okay, this is in the role, this is my, this is my cluster, this is whatever else, Go, and Puppet figures out from there. Dragons, oh, the famous one, documentation, uh, Google's API, stateful data, and of course, IPv6. Uh, for those of you who follow uh, Nanog, uh, Geoff Houston had a pretty nice presentation about the state of uh, DNS, and somewhere in there, he had two countries that had good IPv6 penetration. There is a small country called Belgium and a slightly different country called India, which are, which are green in his map because they've got more than 10% penetration. Everybody else is worse off. And uh, India's IPv6 is mostly one telecom. Everybody else is going, yep, no, we are going to carry a great NAT. Google's documentation lags behind software, is inconsistent, and hasn't changed for a few years. I will not uh, make more comments about the state of uh, their documentation, but uh, finding useful documentation is hard. Sometimes it turns out that you find it on the third page of the Google search when you're doing 100 pages, and then that's because somebody else has written a how-to, and you, oh, that was last year, but I can reason my way forward from there. Uh, their API teams are slightly problematic which is where we started with going, ah, Terraform is horrible. It is inconsistent. Nope. The problem is in the backend API. There, so I want to say, create a disk and attach it to a VM. Oh, okay, you can do that. So do you use a name to refer to it or do you use a, or do you use, use a reference URL to it? And so I want to put this VM in a particular network. Is that a name or a reference? Your guess is as good as mine. You have to read the documentation for the API to figure this out. And they don't have examples. Yep, here's a method call. They need a lot more examples. Method call, yes, okay. But how do you do this to put it all together? Not going to tell you. Stateful data, there are no good answers here. Google offers multiple storage options, but if I wanted to replace my Galera clusters with Cloud SQL, that is not going to happen because Cloud SQL tends to go down for maintenance occasionally, which is fine, except uh, they have failure me failover mechanisms that don't work. If it's a zone level failure, it will fail just fi fail over fine, but if you say, I'm going to maintain do maintenance on the sub part of the zone or region, whatever, nope. Yep, your, uh, we understand your master database rebooted and it took 15 minutes to reboot, but we are sorry, you have an outage in spite of having a failover machine. So you can also do, uh, they have a bunch of other stuff which you can do, but we are currently just running Galera clusters there. 
IPv6, I'm going to call Google out on this one. Compute is limited in v6 support. Uh, because we have games on Apple Cloud, Apple, you need to have working v6. So we needed, uh, at that point, uh, the only way we could do this was by routing IPv6 to Amsterdam and then pushing it into, Google, then having a proxy there to go, proxy to Google Cloud. They now have, they now, now do support v6 on load balancers. It's not throughout yet. Monitoring stack driver was pretty nice. Yep, integrated and the new pricing made it completely unviable for us. It's cheaper for me to say, well, I can hire a full-time employee and just to run an ELK stack than to do this, than to use Stackdriver. So you, they don't have a good alternative for a time series database, so we are still running our own Graphite instances. Plan, for, plan to run your own infrastructure for monitoring at least. You can't just outsource that bit. We use uh, Graphite data for alerting based on Grafana, so Slightly more important, especially given that it's all business metrics and developers are on call and they write their own alerts here. It's no, hosting really doesn't do too much about saying, oh, except the occasional box is up and down. Stackdriver is not a good analytics replacement. Where we do save a lot of money is by moving our BI stack out. We're using proprietary software there. Replacing it with Google's hosted solution is a bit cheaper. Uh, quite a lot cheaper. Legacy code, it's being migrated wholesale, lift, shift, rewrites. Well, there was a goal to have it done by March of this year. Um, if I'm lucky, it will be probably March of next year. It does not benefit from moving to the cloud. The pain of running it on OpenStack VMs or running it on hardware or running it on cloud, same thing because it's still the same software. It's not designed to just fail over, die, and come back. Database migrations are, well, interesting because you don't really want downtime. We can have some downtime, but not too much. So being able to sync and replicate databases to the cloud, plus uh, you, automat you get some nice version bumps there, which is fine, but unexpected. Uh, so CPU utilization doubles because of the spectra fixes. So it's mostly currently, we can only see that on internal hardware and where we have massive over-provisioning, so actual impact is minimal. But, so when I was restoring a database to the cloud, it went from, that same restore I did in a, two different environments, and it went from 26 hours to 56. Just doing nothing except load file into MySQL. So that was a bit of an impact. And yeah, so last slide, uh, cloud migration is a business decision. Please do not jump to the cloud because it is hip. Your costs are, pro your runtime costs are probably going to increase. What you can save on is either full-time employees or you can save on the, the cost of possibly some proprietary software or you get big wins by saying, I can get uh, scalability, but Cost cutting, not the best reason to go to cloud at all. Outsourcing your L1 operations team, first level operations, for hardware, whatever, to, uh, if you're outsourced to India, well, good luck, but you're, got the, you're going to have the same problems whether you outsource to Google or not. Their priorities are not your business priority. You care about uptime, they care about something else. Which provider you want to go with is pretty small differences, tooling available, Ask me in another five years, we'll actually see something useful. And you will need a bunch of changes to your process. So I think I have a few seconds for questions, but I'm around. If anybody has questions, I think we can do one or two right now. All right, Nick. Yeah, you're talking about using uh, Google or Amazon, and you briefly touched on it being cheaper to run your own infra infrastructure. Um, what about setting up your own cloud infrastructure? Uh, is that is what we were running on? Uh, so we were running on our own cloud, and 
The problem is you still need to maintain your own hardware and refresh it and have, you need people to maintain OpenStack and replace, op update OpenStack all the time and we just didn't have the time to do that and support developers and stay up to date on security and run everything else including the networks. It was just, we, we would probably need to double the or triple the size of our small team. At this point we have seven people and we really don't need more. So running your own cloud is an option, but for us, it did not make sense. If your case will be different if you're a bigger company. Okay, that's, um, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Dev Des. Um, next up.